Pang Tong, Zhu Shu, and Sima Hui. Pang Tong's behaviour displayed high moral standards, but he was originally disregarded because he was simple and plain looking. However, his tutor, a hermit named Sima Hui, held him in high regard and dubbed him as the crown of scholars in Jing province. Pang Tong studied under Sima Hui alongside Zhu Ge Liang, Zhu Xu, and Xiang Lang, but unlike in the novel, it wasn't only Sima Hui who recommended the pair to Liu Bei. Pang Di Gong, Tong's uncle, also recommended the young talents to Liu Bei at a time where Sima Hui was an official. Zhu Xu used to be a vigilante swordsman in his early life, but he kept running into trouble with the authorities. He would go on to renounce his old ways, and he took up scholarly pursuits instead. He lived as a recluse in Jing province, where he befriended Zhu Ge Liang and briefly became an advisor to Liu Bei. Sima Hui was born at an unknown date in Ying Chuan Commandery. His courtesy name was Dikao. The courtesy name was the name which was bestowed upon one at a time where they reached adulthood to go alongside their given birth name. Beside these two names, he also had a professional name, or an art name, of Shui Jing. These types of names were used by artists, poets and writers. They originated when the educated upper class gave nicknames to the artisans of their time. Sima Hui later moved to Northern Jing, where he became known to never mention others' shortcomings or flaws. His reply to both good and bad news would always be how, literally meaning good or yes. If somebody asked him how he was, he replied good. When somebody told him that their son had died, he said very good. His wife once scolded him for this when saying, everyone sees you as a person of good moral conduct, so they are willing to share their problems with you. Why do you say very good when someone tells you that their son has just died? Hui answered with, it's also good to hear what you've just said. This gave rise to a Chinese idiom which translates to Mr. Yes or Mr. Good. Zhu Xu was also from Ying Chuan Commandery. His original name was Shan Fu, but the origin of the surname Shan is not clear. In his youth, he was a good swordsman, and he helped someone take revenge by helping them kill another person. He covered his face in white chalk, and let his hair go wild to disguise himself. But later, when he refused to give his name to an official, he was bound to a car and paraded around town. All of the locals were asked to identify the man, but nobody came forth. Zhu Xu's fellows came to his rescue later and freed him, where he was so relieved to be saved that he gave up his life as a swordsman to become a scholar. When he first attended school, Zhu Xu was cast out by his classmates because of his rough background. He maintained a hard-working and humble attitude throughout. He would wake up early to clean the school alone, and paid great attention to his studies. During this time, he became close friends with Xi Dao, and when a war broke out in central China, the pair left for Jing province. Pang Tong was from Xingyang Commandery, where during his youth he was not held in high regard by anyone for a simple and plain look apart from his uncle, Pang De Gong. Uncle De Gong was already an acquaintance of Zhu Ge Liang, and would always bow when visiting him, so De Gong soon earned Zhu Ge's deepest respect. His son, Pang Shan Min, went on to marry one of Zhu Ge Liang's sisters, but died young. Shan Min's son would go on to become the administrator of Zhang Qi much later, between the years 280 and 289. Sima Hui also looked up to De Gong as an older brother, as he was ten years his senior. He would affectionately call De Gong Lord Pang so much that people began to think it was his actual personal name. One day, Pang De Gong was crossing the Mian River to pay sacrificial tributes to his ancestor's tomb. Whilst he was away, Sima Hui visited his house and ushered his wife and children. He told them to prepare a meal for an important guest, and so they respectfully followed his instructions. When Pang De Gong returned and saw what was going on, he stood in attention for the meeting, even though he didn't know who the guest was. The surprise guest was Zhu Shu who became acquainted with the other guests during the banquet. During his ten years in Jing province, Zhu Xu maintained a close friendship with Zhu Ge Liang, Shi Dao, and Meng Gong Wei. They often travelled and studied together. At either 18 or 19 years old, Pang Tong was sent by his uncle to visit Sima Hui, who at this point was well known for spotting and recommending men of talent. They met at a mulberry tree, where Sima Hui climbed up to get the fruit, whilst Pang Tong sat below. They chatted back and forth all day until nightfall, where after Hui recognised Tong as an extraordinary talent and dubbed him as the crown of scholars in Jing province. Hui sighed with relief and said, Pang De Gong truly knows how to judge people. This is truly a boy of majestic moral character. From here on, the scholar gentry began to think more highly of him, and so gave him a nickname, just like they had with the others before. Zhu Ge Liang was known as Crouching Dragon, Sima Hui went by his Taoist name, Walter Mirror, and Pang Tong became known as Fledging Phoenix. 
This was also translated as Young Phoenix by his uncle. Pang Tong went on to serve as an officer of merit in Nan Commandery. He showed great care and conscientiousness in his duties here. His sociable and thorough approach to fostering and mentoring led to him being nominated as an appraiser. When he reviewed people, he focused more on their personal virtues rather than their abilities. When he was asked to assess a person, he was known to generously overpraise. He was fond of ethical lessons and consistently strove to maintain high moral standards. Some people were puzzled by his methods and questioned him why he did this. The world is currently in disorder and customs and principles often forgotten. Good people are overwhelmed by the evil. I desire to change social norms and revive good customs by encouraging good people and giving them an exaggerated reputation, so they can be admired by the many and serve as role models for others. Let's say I give exaggerated phrases for ten, but I'm wrong for five of them. However, I have still gotten half of them. Then they can act as lofty examples to teach others of our time and cause the ambitious to act fairly. Is this not acceptable? When Liu Bei was at Xinyi County, he went to visit Sim Ahui, who told him, Confucian academics and common scholars, how much do they know about current affairs? Those who analyse current affairs well are the elites. Crouching Dragon and Young Phoenix are the only ones in this region. Around this time, Zhu Xu also went to meet with Liu Bei, where he received a warm reception. He recommended Zhu Ge to Liu Bei, which he agreed with, and so he asked Zhu to arrange the meeting. He explained, you must visit this man in person, he cannot be invited to meet you. Liu Bei eventually succeeded in recruiting Zhu Ge Liang in 207, after three consecutive visits. Pei Songji later contradicts this by insisting Zhu Ge visited Liu first. Another analysis suggests that both records could be true, that Zhu Ge visited first to display his abilities, then Liu followed up with three visits where they discussed the Long Zhong plan. When Tao invaded Jing province in 208, Zhu Xu accompanied Liu Bei and many of his followers south towards Xiaku. During the Battle of Changban, Zhu Xu's mother was captured by Tao's forces, so he decided to leave Liu Bei to reunite with his mother. Before he left, he pointed to his heart and told Liu, I wanted to join you, General, in making great achievements. This is my purpose in life. Now that I've lost my mother, I've also lost my sense of direction. This isn't going to be helpful. I now bid farewell to you. When he left, Shi Dao followed him, and they both went to serve Tao Tao. Tao also recruited Sima Hui this year, but he passed away before he could make any use of the hermit's talents. Pang Tong did not participate in the Battle of Red Cliffs, thus he did not fake defection to Tao Tao, or present the chain-linking strategy. The next year, after the Battle of Red Cliffs, Zhou Yu took control of and became the administrator of Nan Commandery. Pang Tong served under Zhou as an official until he passed away the next year. He personally helped escort his coffin back to Jiangdong, and then attended his funeral where many officials of Wu came to hear of his reputation. He befriended Lu Ji, Gu Xiao, and Xuan Kong, who had all gathered at the Western Gate when he left to return to Jing province. Tong took the time to appraise them each separately. Lu Ji was described as a horse that cannot run fast, but a strong willpower. Gu Xiao was compared to an ox that is physically weak, but capable of bearing burdens over great distances. Gu Xiao then asked, You are also known for being a good judge of character. Between us, who do you think is the better one? Tong answered, I'm not as good as you in associating with people and assessing their characters. However, when it comes to politics and strategy, it seems I'm one day ahead of you. Gu Xiao agreed with this, and they both developed a closer bond. Chuan Kong was appraised as someone generous who admires respectable men. They were all three of them very pleased with his comments. Somebody asked though, does that mean Lu Ji is better than Gu Xiao? To which Tong replied, although a horse can run fast, it can only bear the weight of one person. An ox can travel a hundred miles a day, it can certainly bear more than just the weight of one person. As Pang Tong was leaving, Lu Ji and Gu Xiao told him, when peace is restored in the empire, we want to have a good discussion with you about famous people. Pang Tong next served as an assistant officer and as the county magistrate of Li Yang, but was later dismissed from office due to poor performance. Lu Su recommended Pang Tong to Liu Bei as a great talent that should be employed to important tasks and not managing a small territory. Zhu Ge Liang also agreed with this, and so Liu Bei agreed to meet with him. He became greatly impressed with Pang Tong and entrusted him with important matters. He was assigned as an assistant officer in the headquarters office and Liu Bei's treatment towards Pang Tong was second to that only of Zhu Ge Liang. They were both later appointed as military advisor generals of the household. One time at a feast, Liu spoke to Tong highlighting his service under Zhou Yu. He asked, 
Before, when I went to Wu, I heard that he secretly pressed Sun Chuan to detain me. Is this true? When a man is with his lord, he must be utterly honest with him. Tong confirmed this was indeed true. Liu Bei then gave a sigh of relief. At that moment, I was in danger and they had rescued me, hence I could not refuse their invitation, and I almost failed to escape Xiao Yu's grasp. In this world, men of talent and wisdom can see through each other's plans. Before I left, Kong Wing protested against this with all of his will. He had seen through this. However, I didn't listen because I was thinking that I was Xiao Yu's defence against the North, and that he would need my help. I had no doubts about him. This was truly entering the tiger's den and a very risky plan. Around the two tens, Pang Tong convinced Liu Bei to seize Yi province to expand his power so that it can rival that of Tao Tao's. Jing province is in ruins and ravaged by constant conflicts. Its people are exhausted, with Sun Quan to the east and Tao Tao to the north looming over them. Therefore, the tripartite balance will be difficult to achieve. Now Yi province is wealthy and its people are strong. Its population is in the millions, along with many troops and horses present in all the region. All of this can be obtained, and from then on would serve as the foundation for the future. Now you can seize it and accomplish your great enterprise. Liu Bei answered, At this moment my rival is Tao Tao. Both of us are opposite as water and fire. He is suspicious whilst I am lenient. He is cruel while I am kind. He is deceitful whilst I am loyal. If I am always acting in opposition against him, in that way our plan may be accomplished. Now for a small reason, I would lose the faith and trust of all the people under the sky, therefore I won't do it. Pang Tong insisted that this is a period of perpetual change, where one must show himself flexible and cannot be settled by a single principle. Subduing the weak while attacking secretly was the way of the five hegemons. Ending the rebellion while defending the loyal, treating them with respect and honestly whilst rewarding them fairly after the conflict ends. How is that turning back on righteousness? Be careful that if you don't take it today, it ends in someone else's lap. Liu Bei heeded Pang Tong's suggestion and entered Yi province on the pretext of assisting Liu Zhang with military aid. Pang Tong accompanied him, whilst Zhu Geliang remained behind in Jing. When Liu Bei met with Liu Zhang in person at Fu County, Pang Tong urged him to capture him then and there and force him to hand over Yi province. Liu refused though, as he was new to Yi and had not established any foundation yet, and so Liu Zhang safely returned to Chengdu. Tong then outlined three plans for Liu Bei to choose from, the upper, middle and lower. The upper plan was to select the best soldiers to form an elite unit to advance quickly towards Chengdu and force its surrender in military conflict. This was considered the best plan by Tong, who believed Liu Zhang was not competent in military affairs, so the chances of success were high. The middle plan was similar to the upper plan, but a bit more careful in its approach. Tong knew that Yang Huai and Gao Pei were famous generals who led strong troops. In the past, they had also advised Liu Zhang to send Liu Bei back to Jing. Knowing that they would assemble a light cavalry force to see Liu Bei leave, Tong suggested to feign a retreat back to Jing province, pretending it's in danger to lure the generals out of the mountains. They could then kill them, take control of their positions and troops, and finally advance towards Chengdu. The lower plan was to retreat back to Baidi Cheng and wait for another opportunity to attack. Tang Tong warned Liu that if he took too much time and didn't go, then he'd be in great danger and couldn't last. Liu Bei successfully carried out the middle plan. He killed the two generals, then conquered territories as he advanced towards Chengdu. During the conquest of Yi province, a celebration banquet was being held in Fu County. Liu Bei expressed joy in his successes by saying today should be a merry day. Tong chided him, saying, Celebrating the invasion of others' territory isn't what a man of benevolence should do. The drunken Liu Bei angrily cited past heroes who celebrated their victories as well and in question Tong if they too were not men of benevolence before kicking him out. Liu quickly regretted this though, and invited Tong back in. He returned to his seat and did not say anything, acting as usual. Liu then asked, When that quarrel happened just now, whose fault do you think it was? Tong answered that it was both their faults. Liu Bei then laughed, and the banquet continued. This event has been commented on by the historian Zi Zuo Si and Pei Song Zhe. They both highlight that Pang Tong felt guilty as it was originally his plan to invade Yi province, so he restrained himself from having any happy feelings. Shi Suo Si believed Pang Tong's silence and admittance of fault showed the guilt of his actions and willingness to improve himself, whilst also reprimanding Liu Bei honestly with a fear that a conversation could be leaked. Pei Song Shi highlights that when Tong heard Liu Bei acting happy, he acted unconsciously frank and answered him such. 
He says Liu Bei being too drunk and acting happy at another's misfortune was him being at fault, not Pang Tong's, and so believes that the purpose of Tong's admittance of fault was only to avoid conflict. Song Ji noted that though Master Zi Zhuoxi's purpose isn't wrong, the implication of his words have digressed. During a battle against Liu Zhang's forces at Luo County, Pang Tong was hit by a stray arrow and was killed in action whilst laying siege to Luo City. He did not ride atop Hexmark, nor was he shot in Zhang Ren's ambush. Liu Bei honoured him and had a tomb and shrine constructed in Luo County. In modern times, it has become part of the sixth batch of major historical and cultural sites protected at the national level. The temple was built at Bai Ma Temple, literally meaning White Horse Temple. The site is also known as Dragon and Phoenix Shrine, due to the statues of Pang Tong and Zhuge Liang located there. The site had been damaged throughout the ages, but was restored in the year 1691. There are also two conifer trees found within the temple, which are said to have been planted by Zhang Fei. Two hanging scrolls are found within the temple which read, even though it was obvious that the late Emperor Liu Bei favoured Pang Tong, Zhu Geliong was still given the opportunity to be the long-serving minister. Chen Shu's written biography of Pang Tong is also carved in stone on a wall, behind the main hall of the site. Chen Shu appraised Pang Tong as charming, and good at associating with others. He diligently studied the classics, and pondered any strategies for his lord. During his time, people from Jing and Yi provinces thought he was an exceptional talent, in comparison with officials from Wei, Pang Tong was akin to Zun Yu and Zun Yu. Whenever Pang Tong was mentioned to Liu Bei after his passing, he became deeply saddened and would weep. Tong was posthumously made a secondary Marquis after Liu Bei became Emperor. Liu Shan also later bestowed the title Marquis Jing onto him in the year 260. His unnamed father was appointed as a consultant and later received further promotion. Tong's younger brother, Pang Lin, also served in Jing Province's headquarters and fought in the Battle of Yiling alongside Huang Chuan. He was in charge of protecting Xu's northern flank from attacks from Wei. Pang Lin and Huang Chuan became separated from Liu Bei's forces after the battle and ended up surrendering to Wei. Pang Lin served as the administrator of Julu Commandery and received a Marquis title. Earlier, when Tao took control of Jing Province, Pang Lin was separated from his wife. She only managed to reunite with him in 222, after he had joined up with Wei. She had stayed faithful to him during their 14 years of separation, and raised her daughter by herself. Tao Pi bestowed many gifts onto her for her virtues. Pang Tong had a son called Pang Hong. He served in the Shu government, and was known for being upright and outspoken. He once offended Chen Di, the prefect of the Masters of Writing, who in turn blocked any advancements in his career. He died in office, serving as administrator of Fuling County. Zhu Xu had served under Wei for this whole time, and had made no notable contributions. In 220, under Tao Pi, he held the rank of right general of the household, and a palace assistant imperial clerk. When Tao Rui came to the throne, Zhu Geliong heard of Zhu Xu's and Xi Zhao's held ranks within Wei. He was very shocked and exclaimed, Are there so many talents in Wei? Why aren't the talents of these two men put to good use? Xu Xu passed away from illness a few years later, and a tombstone has been found in Peng Chang with his name on it. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button, and I'll see you next time.